Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's four o'clock and we're going to begin. I'm Anita Huberman, CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade. Thank you for virtually attending the town hall this afternoon with the Federal Minister of Middle Class Prosperity and the Associate Minister of Finance, Mona Fortier. Minister Fortier, thank you so much for joining us again, uh, all the way uh, across the nation in Surrey, British Columbia uh, from, uh, from the East. Still at this time, it's important to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwatlen, Ketsi, Semiamu, and Tawasin First Nations. Just a couple of instructions and comments before we begin. This session is being recorded. The link will be sent to you after the session is over for you to share. All attendees are muted. And uh, if you do have any questions, uh, they will be answered after the session is over. If we have time uh, after the actual questions that we have for the minister, we can go to the chat function. But for now, I ask you to write down your questions in the chat function and absolutely we will respond to you. At the Surrey Board of Trade, we are getting questions every single day from our members, trying to navigate the federal government measures that have been introduced as a result of the very unexpected COVID-19 pandemic that we face. We put together a list of top questions for the minister this afternoon, which the minister will respond to after her remarks. There's a lot to cover. And as I mentioned, if time remains, we'll get to your questions as well. And uh, I wanted to also let you know that the Surrey Board of Trade has an emergency business portal specifically for COVID-19 supports. Uh, it is businessinsurrey.com. The links are updated every single day. So you want to really take a look at that and how we can support your business. I also wanted to let you know that at the Surrey Board of Trade, all of my staff have uh, invoked ground zero principles, phoning our members, phoning our businesses, connecting to different levels of government to ensure we're re really responding to your needs. Uh, there's a lot of specific questions that have been emailed to us and we are doing our very best in light of uh, very quick and dynamic circumstances and quick and dynamic announcements by all levels of government in order to support not only our business community, but also our residents. I'm on the Premier's Economic Task Force uh, to really ensure that on a weekly basis, we're communicating with the Premier and the Finance Minister and the Minister of Economic Development on the gaps that businesses and service organizations are facing. I'm on daily calls with the federal government as well, and we have a portal through the Prime Minister's office to really ensure that they are getting that on the ground information. Uh, the city of Surrey in itself, we have weekly pandemic committee calls, so we also need to know and hear from our members in the business community on what impacts, what is going on, what are the gaps that the city of Surrey in itself needs to really take a look at. And so this afternoon, we're so pleased that Minister Fortier is with us. And uh, Minister Fortier, you have the floor now. Thank you so much. Bonsoir tout le monde uh, from Ottawa. I want to uh, say a good evening and good afternoon to you. Uh, before I start, I really want to acknowledge and thank Anita and the Surrey Board of Trade for uh, the great meeting we had together just a few months ago actually, uh, actually a month ago. And it's been uh, surreal to think how much times and conversations have changed in such a short amount of time. Now, I would also like to start by saying that we know that due to the severe impacts of the pandemic is causing, causing businesses need help to keep more workers employed so that Canadians can keep up with their bills. The approach we have taken to respond to this unprecedented crisis has been on three steps. Firstly, we are ensuring that the health and safety of Canadians is at the heart of everything that we are doing. Secondly, we are making sure that everyone is protected and nobody falls through the cracks. And lastly, we are putting in place measures to address the needs and to find solutions 
for all Canadians. This is why over the last three weeks, I have personally engaged with stakeholders across British Columbia, including Mayor McCallum here in Surrey, the Business Council of British Columbia, the BC Chamber of Commerce to help respond the needs of British Columbians and its businesses, and also the Surrey Board of Trade. Now, thanks to everyone's hard work, we were able to put in place a series of broad economy-wide supports as part of our Canada's COVID-19 economic response plan. Et je suis certaine que vous conviendrez tous que nous avons trouvé dans une période de crise sans précédent, alors que nous luttons contre les impacts sanitaires, sociaux et économiques de la pandémie de la COVID-19. Through Canada's COVID-19 Economic Response Plan, we're providing more than $100 billion in direct support, $85 billion in liquidity support through income tax, GST, and customs duty payment referrals, and over $570 billion in additional credit and liquidity support. Additionally, Earlier this week, hundreds of thousands of Canadians began applying for the new Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or some call it the CERB, which was set up to make sure Canadians can afford to put food on the table, pay for housing, and necessary medicine. This provides, sorry, I just lost you. Are you still there, Anita? Okay, this benefit provides $2,000 a month for up to four months to workers who lose their income as a result of the pandemic. To make it as flexible and accessible as possible, the benefit is available to workers whether or not they are eligible for employment insurance. This important measure was put in place to help millions of Canadians impacted by the pandemic financially. The program rolled out started on Monday and we have seen over a million Canadians apply for it. And we will continue to do whatever it takes to make sure that Canadians in various situations have the right support. Furthermore, to help businesses keep their employees or hire them back to help them prepare for recovery, we have also pr proposed a wage subsidy for qualifying businesses. The Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy would apply at a rate of 75% of the first $58,700 normally earned by employees, which represents a benefit of up to 847 per week and it would be in place for a 12 week period from March 15th to June 6th 2020. And as of today or this uh, this morning probably for you, we have announced that the subsidy will be available to employers who have suffered a drop in gross revenues of at least 15% in March and then 30% in April and May. Employers of all sizes and across all sectors of the economy, with the exception of public sector entities, would be eligible for this. Bakeries, movie theaters, hardware stores, you name it, if they have been significantly impacted by COVID-19, they could be eligible. And this subsidy would prevent further job losses and encourage employees to rehire workers previously laid off as a result of COVID-19. This is important. By keeping your employees or their employees, Canadian companies will be in a better position to bounce back after the crisis, the pandemic phase. We have also introduced a new Canada Emergency Business Account, some call it SIBA, and this program will provide up to $25 billion to eligible financial institutions so they can provide interest-free, partially forgivable loans of up to $40,000 to small businesses, including nonprofits. 
These loans are guaranteed and funded by the Government of Canada and will ensure that small businesses have access to the capital they need at a 0% interest rate to pay for rent and other important costs over the next number of months. Canada's economic response plan to respond to COVID-19 is the largest and most rapidly deployed peacetime investment in Canadian history. We have worked hard to get to this point, but we will continue to do as long as this persists. We are prepared to do pretty much whatever it takes to make sure that Canadians are safe and secure. Now, um, in this, this unprecedented time, all developments related to COVID-19 and work hard to ensure businesses get the support they need. Um, before I uh, open to questions, I really want to stress the fact that we are in unprecedented times and we are uh, still really uh, looking at the first four weeks of investments in emergency situations. And you, as probably as you heard with the Prime Minister, we will continue to work on needs that uh, we see as we go along. Now, uh, now I will be open up to your questions and please note that I may not have all the answers today at this is a very dynamic situation that evolves every day and every hour. However, my team would be happy to follow up with you. And I believe Anita will also uh, probably be able to come to uh, follow up with you with our responses. And I really wanna thank you so much for all the hard work that you're doing in your community. And we know these are difficult times and we will get through it together. And to do that, we need to work together. So for now, those will be my opening remarks. And now I would like to start with the questions. So Minister, we prepared some of the top questions that we've been receiving that we feel would be relevant to you. And of course, if we have time, we'll go to the questions from the chat function. I've been able to respond to some of them already. Uh, wage, we heard a lot of it, uh, good announcements, good steps this morning from the Prime Minister, uh, more work to be done, wage subsidies, other programs. They're not for all businesses, they're not for all service organizations, but definitely we know financial support is needed, cash flow, liquidity. How is the federal government going to address the gaps for support, uh, not only for business, but also for not-for-profits? And when, just a second part, when will the legislation for the new wage subsidy be approved? So I will uh, start with the second part of your question. Um, we are, uh, as you probably saw in the news, uh, Pablo Rodriguez, our, our leader in government, has been uh, working with the opposition parties to determine the date and uh, also to look at what will be presented as legislation. I'm very hopeful that we will, in the coming days, a return to Parliament with a um, reduced, um, uh, reduced number of uh, MPs to pass the legislation on wage subsidy. So I'm hopeful that will happen uh, in the next uh, week. Also, uh, for the first question, and I thank you for it, um, as you know, our economic response plan. The uh, government is really making significant investments to help Canadian businesses face the economic impact and also for nonprofits. Now this plan, as I mentioned, includes loan programs, tax deferrals, direct support, including, as we said, for charities and nonprofit organizations. The emergency wage subsidy uh, will cover 75% of an employer's wages for employers of all sizes and across all sectors, including not-for-profit and charities. And as I said in my um, earlier uh, statement, the, the businesses and nonprofit organizations who have suffered a drop in gross revenues of at least 15% in March and then 30% in April and May will be eligible. Also, employers will have the ability to make choices to respond to their particular circumstances. 
and, and you will see the details on the website for that. As for regarding nonprofit organization and registered charities, they will benefit from the additional flexibility provided to all employers with respect to the revenue loss calculation. Now, in order to address the specific circumstances faced by charities and nonprofits, our government is giving these organizations more flexibility in how to assess the 30% revenue drop. So by giving them the option to use an average of their gross revenues between January and February 2020 as a basis of comparison, or giving them the choice to include or exclude the portion of revenues received from the government from that comparison. So that gives you an idea of um, what will happen for charities and uh, nonprofits and also uh, for businesses. And I will send you the link to uh, get more details on those specific criteria and help uh, your members to better understand how to be, how to calculate uh, that uh, criteria. I really appreciate that. And I have to tell you the civil service uh, in both the federal government and the provincial government, they have been very responsive in answering our specific questions. So we're very thankful for that as are all chambers of commerce, boards of trades across this nation. Now, um, the second most common question that I receive is around loans and credit cards and banks. Uh, the interest rates are high. Um, you know, businesses are going to go further into debt when all of this is over. And we've been advocating for, of course, more cash flow, more liquidity through the Surrey Board of Trade, but we don't want businesses to go further into debt. And uh, really, what is it that the federal government can do to alleviate debt burden? Uh, good question. And uh, our government is ensuring that the financial sector remains resilient in the face and the stress that we have and continues to extend credit and support uh, to Canadians and for our economy. And that's why uh, we have also introduced the business, business credit availability program, the BCAP, to help Canadian businesses obtain financing. We have also uh, worked with the, the financial institutions, banks, and also uh, credit unions that have been accredited. And they are committed to work with customers on a case-by-case -case basis to provide flexible solutions to help them manage hardship during this hardship. Accredited, uh, accredited credit unions, I said earlier, are also working very hard to support impacted consumers during these difficult times. And Canada's largest banks uh, have uh, also announced that they will temporarily, temporarily provide reduced interest rates on credit cards for customers who are experiencing financial hardship as a result of COVID-19 and are receiving a credit card payment deferral. Now this means reducing interest rates by, for example, as much as 50%. We uh, do welcome the actions by the banking sector and we will continue to work with them to continue to support Canadians through these difficult times. And again, we know that everybody is trying to deliver those services uh, at the right now so we know that we will be uh, continuing our conversations with financial institutions to make sure that those programs are delivered on the ground. Thank you Minister. I, I did want to let you know and of course I've let the um, other ministries know as well that the flow through uh, approval through EDC and BDC those loans and the eligibility criteria is really challenging uh, for a lot of Canadian businesses. A lot of our members, for example, it's just very challenging for them to even get through. So uh, just to for you to be aware of on the ground challenges as well as you're doing your work uh, in Ottawa. May and I just add the fact that we are continuing to increase uh, the capacity to answer, uh, as we have already heard many uh, telling us that the, it's hard to connect. We are increasing capacity as we speak. 
and uh, hopefully that will be uh, something that will you'll see as a difference in the next few days and uh, over the over the weeks coming thank you minister you know one of the the key measures that we also need to support on is not only uh, innovation of course during this pandemic time but innovation and planning for post-pandemic. We're going to be facing a new economy, that is uh, for sure. Post-pandemic economic focus, focus on infrastructure investments to really reinvigorate the economy is needed. Uh, so can you provide your perspective on that? Well, thank you for the question and also uh, realizing, we all realize we're in this new economy uh, with uh, the COVID-19 uh, really changing our normal day-to-day -day lives and even how we do business or how we will be managing uh, our different uh, governments and also you know even for nonprofits so we really really understand that this situation is also evolving every day and will continue to do so currently and as i said in my opening remarks our top priority continues to be protecting the health and safety of canadians we also put forth emergency um, supports or programs to be able to really get to canadians and businesses as quick as possible and i can assure you that the government is working day and night to obtain and manufacture the goods and services needed for Canada to fight this virus. And we will continue and work very hard to support and stimulate the economy with the right tools at the right time, while doing our best to track the evolution of the virus from outbreak to recovery. And uh, we know that we will have to really focus on that recovery uh, space uh, and, and, and we will very soon, but for the moment, we're really focusing on the current needs and hopefully maybe in a couple of weeks we'll be able to have another round table and maybe work together on, on thinking how this recovery should be planned and, and working with all levels of government but also with the, the Surrey Board of Trade to see what would be those levers that will help us go through the, the, that recovery phase. One of the measures that the Premier's Economic Task Force is looking at is also post-pandemic activity as well. Uh, so those conversations are already taking place, uh, really relating to uh, infrastructure investments, uh, things that can be done right now to prepare uh, for things like the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project or other transportation infrastructure, things that can be done uh, remotely, procurement opportunities uh, that many of our businesses uh, can really take advantage of, even if they're working from home. So really trying to think out of the box uh, our messages mm -hmm. that I've been sending, others have been sending um, through our, our different connections with government minister just so you're aware right and also i, I believe that uh, you know i i will and our, our the finance department and the whole government approach will be working with partners across the country not just government but also uh different uh, board of trades i know that the bc uh, Council has been working already on a recovery um, kind of a think tank. So we will be looking at that and uh, hopefully we can work on that together. But at this time, uh, we uh, in the past uh, three weeks have been really focusing on the current needs. And uh, I'm hopeful that we can have uh, really that thinking process on, on which um, next steps we'll take for the recovery phase. When we take a look at um, all Canadians not being left out and we have uh, some service organizations that uh, provide services to those with uh, disabilities and those with uh, all abilities needing supports, much more needs to be done. For example, allowing access to caregivers to emergency uh, would be beneficial. Many with disabilities can't communicate. They can't rely on caregivers to provide support. Medical staff, medical equipment, of course, everything is strained at this time. Can you provide a, a perspective on supports for those with disabilities, knowing they're part of our workforce as well, uh, really serving our business community? 
Uh, it's a great question. And uh, honestly, we know that um, our government has been uh, working very hard to ensure Canadians with disabilities get not only the information they need, but also the support they need as it is another uh, level of stress for them as uh, we know they've been really uh, been touched by this COVID-19. I was talking with Minister Qualtro who has the responsibility for people with disabilities and we're really continuing to work on how we can better serve uh, Canadians with disabilities. And right now we are actively working to ensure that uh, all Canadians, not only uh, the ones that are you know, most vulnerable, but also all Canadians have the resources they need to protect themselves and their families. And uh, we are also including experts in accessibility and disability inclusion that are working with the Department of Health to better support and understand the realities for Canadians that are living with uh, disabilities during this time. And we are also finding ways to implement ALS, LSQ, uh, plain language text and federal responses so that all Canadians can have access to real time information. I don't know if you've seen in the past few weeks, we, we saw the prime minister and uh, with the different press conference, uh, the fact that we've given that access uh, with uh, ALS, LSQ, and also access to uh, getting that information. So we know there's much more work to do and we will continue to put uh, a lot of efforts towards uh, greater inclusion in everything that we do. And uh, all governments are working together to support uh, Canadians of all ages all abilities and to help them tackle with this unique challenge that uh, we're facing every day. Thank you, Minister. One of the uh, top, one of the top questions that I received from our members is uh, they had to make very challenging uh, decisions to lay off their workers and they needed assistance in providing guidance, uh, EI. And then we learned that Service Canada uh, you know, the brick and mortar locations were not open. The, the online version, uh, online assistance, the telephone version uh, was available, but a lot of people, and we're discovering, uh, they don't have access to internet, uh, surprisingly, or um, there's a huge wait time on phones for extended periods, and people are just so anxious, and you know, they've been contacting me and, and others around uh, Service Canada, perhaps being an essential service. I know it's under a unionized regime, but uh, like grocery stores, would the federal government reconsider opening those Service Canada brick and mortar locations? Well, thank you for that question. And uh, it is a very important question. You know, Service Canada delivers critical services uh, to Canadians and, and they will continue to work hard to ensure that Canadians do have access to these services even during uh, COVID-19. Uh, situation and um, we are temporarily closing our Service Canada centers because we need to keep our employees safe and healthy uh, by practicing physical and social distancing so that they can continue to process the benefits and provide services to Canadians so where so they can get that need that help where they need it. Um, now, these services remain available, like you mentioned, by phone and online uh, currently. And uh, we are working very hard to increase capacity. And uh, we also are recognizing that this might be a challenge for some who prefer to receive this service in person. Uh, but we must continue to lead by example. And we know that social distancing currently is essential during this situation and we will continue to find innovative ways to help uh, these um, Canadians that uh, cannot uh, find the solution either online or by phone. So we're working on it very hard as we speak. Minister, one of the true economic solutions uh, for COVID-19 is of course to find a vaccine but to also have the distribution infrastructure 
for that vaccine when it ultimately comes. What is, uh, or can you speak to the development of a vaccine? I would uh, thank you again for that uh, question. I think we're all uh, looking forward to uh, having access to that vaccine. But as you know, since day one, we have been working with the Public Health Agency of Canada and the World Health Organization to ensure that Canada remains a leader in the fight against COVID-19. We have enhanced our capacity in research and development including research on medical uh, countermeasures, including antivirals, vaccine development, and support for clinical trials. And we provided 275 million in additional funding. Um, and this was on top of the 27 million announcement to fund coronavirus research in Canada. And our country's top researchers and scientists are currently working around the clock to provide answers to this unprecedented uh, situation. And I want to highlight and really thank them for everything that they're doing to protect Canadians. And I know that we will continue to uh, put all efforts to find uh, that uh, vaccine. Thank you very much. Um, my next question is, is really focused on the loans that businesses are trying to get through the banks. Uh, there seems to be, from what I've been hearing and others have been hearing, is an uncoordinated response by banks to their customers with respect to messaging and access to government programs. Some are proactively reaching out to their clients. Other banks must be contacted individually and asked about the programs and often with little or no response or details uh, that are provided. There needs to be better communication and coordination. I've spoken to different levels of government on that already, uh, but what are your thoughts about that, Minister? I think we all agree and even the financial institutions agree that we have uh, been really all uh, surprised in the past uh, month that we have to deliver and help uh, Canadians and be better coordinating. So that is why we've been working closely with financial institutions and the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada to put in place a plan to track bank's performance relative to their public commitments. And our government has also been working close with uh, close coordination with financial institutions to find the right credit solutions to help Canadians and their businesses in, again, these difficult times. Now, these solutions are being designed, created, and developed in real time to meet the rapidly evolving needs of all Canadians. and. Uh, even banks and credit unions uh, are working closely with partners to ensure all measures and programs are in line in order to best support Canadians throughout the outbreak. And the government will continue to ensure clear communications on the steps we're taking to support Canadians. Minister, we lost you there. Today's a great example that, uh, you know, uh, Minister? We'll just uh, find out what's going on here. Credit unions to be able to better um, coordinate their uh, communications. So we will continue to work hard to do that. And if you have any suggestions or solutions you believe we should be taking into account, please don't hesitate to share that with us. We'll take that in consideration. Thank you, Minister. We lost you there for a little bit. Uh, oh, no. But, uh, that, Do you want me to start over again? Uh, no, that's okay. okay. Uh, but I think really we know that uh, the federal government is making changes, making decisions uh, really related to matters that will usually take a year or two. And I think there's a great recognition of that, but a lot of uh, businesses are feeling really anxious, just so you know, because uh, they put their heart, their soul, their savings into their business, mm -hmm. and now they're facing a, a crisis situation. And uh, they just feel 
terrible that they have to lay off staff as well. And so these challenges around loans and banks and credit card interest rates, all of those pieces uh, still need to continue to be looked at. And, and I know that government is. And I agree. And I want to reiterate that uh, because we have such great minds across the country, this is why we will continue to focus on trying to get better communications out and uh, hopefully uh, that the banks and, and credit unions will be able to deliver those services and also receive those ideas from your members uh, on how we can do it better and uh, we will concentrate on really trying to deliver that. Thank you, Minister. And I, I do see some questions in the chat room and I'll get to them uh, very shortly if we have time, uh, but absolutely I will respond to you uh, very shortly. Uh, so our next question, I have two more questions for you, Minister, is around face masks. It seems clear that current research indicates that uh, uh, the use of face masks helps a little bit. Um, what, are, what is your perspective um, in terms of making face masks mandatory in terms of uh, wearing it in public spaces? Well, again, um, I would uh, start by saying that uh, we are uh, really using science and experts to give us uh, how we should be uh, moving forward. And as you know, uh, Dr. Tam and uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada is really putting out those, uh, those different measures and uh, making sure that we follow them is uh, what all Canadians should be doing. And we're also working with the BC government and even the local entities to make sure that we coordinate what should be done. And uh, we have, just about masks, we have put orders for more masks and medical equipment to keep our communities safe and we're going to continue to do that. And, uh, you know, even Dr. Tam explained that uh, wearing a mask does not prevent you from spreading the infection, but it is something that if you do choose to wear a mask, the best protection against COVID-19 is really to stay at home. <laughs> if you must leave, practice social and physical distancing. If you are sick, we ask you not to go outside and you should isolate yourself from others in your home. Seems we have to wash our hands regularly. It's a really, really important measure. And uh, also clean commonly used surfaces. And we will continue to encourage Canadians to seek the latest advice on COVID-19 through our website, uh, which is canada.ca slash coronavirus or also through the Canada COVID-19 app that is available to Canadians. And again, we will continue to work with uh, provincial uh, and territorial governments to make sure we get uh, the equipment and the masks needed across the country. And I think obviously, even in post-pandemic times, uh, making uh, commercial made uh, manufacturing of masks or homemade masks. Uh, it could be a, a staple of our, our future economy for sure. And maybe I should add also, and you probably heard the Prime Minister say this, or uh, our industry uh, minister, Minister Baines, we're focusing also on uh, great solutions uh, made in Canada. And as you know, we're investing in businesses across Canada to provide those solutions. And for example, masks and equipment are part of that innovation of a made in Canada um, uh, strategy. So I think it's important to show that we will have to continue to focus on a Maine in Canada strategy. And we are promoting, of course, funding that's made available through the British Columbia Digital Supercluster Fund to really focus on those new health technologies, whether they're soft technologies or hard technologies. Uh, and so I am amazed by what we've seen just in the past three weeks across the country on examples on how businesses have been so creative and innovative and, and finding those solutions. So it's 
something that I found uh, pretty amazing to see how those businesses are really helping and providing the solutions that we need. Thank you. Minister, my next question, a little bit contentious, but definitely people are feeling frustrated and a lot of anxiety about how did this happen in the first place? Uh, what is the Canadian government's uh, intention uh, to ban wet markets in China or to at least uh, look at a global type of unification to look at uh, wet markets uh, that are still alive and thriving throughout the world? So right now our focus and at this time is squarely on fighting this virus and getting, can, getting Canadians with the support that they need. We know this is a global challenge and Canada is very well positioned to respond and there will be many lessons learned when we emerge from this crisis. But the fact is that we are in this together. And that's why we are coordinating closely with our international partners and putting in place measures to support Canadians during these very trying times. And right now is the time to focus on getting through this. Again, we got to do this together. Thank you very much, Minister. So I'm just uh, going to go into the chat room. Uh, we have some time for questions. And if you can't respond, it's okay. Uh, just say so and uh, we will get the response to our attendees uh, absolutely after the session is over. And as I mentioned, the civil service at the federal government is, has been just amazing in responding to these uh, very unique questions. Uh, so um, I just wanted to, from Dana uh, Miller, will policy changes deem employment services as essential services now and into the future? This change in policy will secure existing jobs of employment services and assist their many clients who are seeking jobs when the pandemic occurred. Many of these job seekers may have barriers such as disabilities, we spoke about that, and needed employment supports. Um, and she also goes on to mention a new anxiety could be on the rise due to the pandemic. And as people return to their jobs and job searching people will require assistance. It would be helpful for Canadians to know that employment service providers are going to be there for them as an essential service. Well, it's a great question. I think it's uh, also a good comment that we should take into account uh, on uh, how uh, this will be a situation where we need to figure out how people will go back to uh, new work or, or their work and we will have to work with the partners on the ground to do this. So I believe that uh, we need to strategize and, and look at what is available in the different communities and who's the expert and we can work with them to, uh, to make sure that we better understand what are the solutions uh, locally uh, or even in, in, in your region. Thank you. A question from Tracy Reddies, who's a, a local MLA. Uh, and I, I know I've mentioned this so many times uh, as well, businesses don't wanna take on more debt. Is there any consideration by the federal government to give upfront grants uh, to small businesses? Well, uh, the one I would say right now is the Canada Emergency uh, Business uh, Account, CBA, is uh, one uh, loan and grant kind of, because if you repay in less than a year, you will keep $10,000 out of the 40000 That is something that we are offering right now. And we will continue to look at what other solutions, uh, depending on the realities and, and what we don't cover, uh, we will continue to find uh, some, uh, some new measures. Also, I would say that uh, if you go on our coronavirus um, website, you will see what programs are offered for businesses, what programs are offered for individuals. And you can see that there are many, um, many uh, 
programs that, that are offered for uh, depending on if you're an individual or a business, uh, small, medium or large, or even a sole proprietor. So you will be very guided on that page. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Jack, uh, a local plastics uh, manufacturer, um, I actually have the answer for him, so you don't need to respond because uh, there really is no answer at this time. More detail is coming out, Jack, about the wage subsidy program. 75% uh, wage subsidy of business income is reduced uh, by 30% comparing to last year. It's a 15% uh, look right now that was announced this morning. Uh, but your specific question is, is the bat bad debt part of the revenue criteria calculation. For example, if the customer is unable to pay a March invoice due to COVID-19 impact, but the revenue is still recorded, how do we handle this? The uncollectible amount can be significant in some cases. So we, we did ask uh, Minister Ng's office that about 20 minutes ago, and the response was no detail on this yet, but it is being looked at, Jack. Uh, so uh, a lot of detail is to be forthcoming, especially after uh, legislation is passed from the Prime Minister's announcement this morning. But I think it's good for you to hear these specific questions, Minister, uh, that we are getting as well. And, and to continue to send us those examples, as we know, we have to find ways to answer those questions. And when we will have the details, we'll send that to you. But in the meantime, it gives us an idea on what else we have to work on if we haven't answered that question. Uh, another question is about the reimbursement of the last quarter of taxes to get money faster to businesses. Don't know if you can respond to that, Minister. Uh, I don't know it by heart, so I wouldn't want to uh, try to uh, expand on this, but I will take it back and answer the question uh, very soon. There has been a lump sum of $2,000 for many Canadians that are on EI. Uh, there, there is a request for a clarification on that, uh, which I can get also if you don't have the response to that minister. If I understand well, the person was on ER? Yes. So uh, they will transfer to uh, the uh, CERB uh, and be able to have the 2000 uh, per month. The travel industry, the hospitality industry has been hit so hard. And especially, well, in Surrey, all of our hotels are shut down, uh, forced to close down. Are there any special considerations for the travel agent industry? Uh, again, as we know, many, many sectors are affected right now. And uh, we have offered some emergency uh, programs to either keep workers in uh, the businesses with uh, the wage subsidy. We're working also on the Canadian emergency business account. And uh, we will be looking at different sectors to see what else we can do, especially the one uh, that uh, you just shared, because we know that it is deeply affected. There's a question around post-secondary student support, and that is under provincial jurisdiction. And there have been some announcements by the provincial government on that front. Uh, but is there anything that the federal government is taking a look at, not only from a post-secondary student perspective, but also from an international student perspective? So great question, as you know, and the Prime Minister mentioned, uh, I believe it was Monday, two days ago only, um, for those that are not eligible for the uh, the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, um, we are working on finding a way to support students. One announcement that was made and uh, shared today by the Prime Minister is the fact that the Canada Summer Jobs Program will be one solution 
Over 70,000 positions across the country will be available for youth and we're working hard on that currently to uh, have those jobs available uh, starting soon and then instead of just making it a summer, uh, if it's next February, and we will also make it more where longer. So we're working with the Canada Summer Jobs Program as a solution, and other solutions are coming up very soon. Thank you, Minister.